Konami reads what you post on social media. Konami will change things if you stop buying product. Konami loves the casual audience because they pay for your tournaments. These are actual things that a former Konami manager said last week on the podcast Heart of the Cast. That product manager is Matt Bell, a household name among veteran Yu-Gi-Oh players who worked at Konami for nine years. It was honestly so damn cool for speaking so candidly about issues that we've never had an official source comment on. And there's a lot to break down here. Today we're going to be reading between the lines of what Matt said on the podcast and gain a better understanding on how the Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG actually works behind the scenes. Before we begin, a huge shout out to Heart of the Cast podcast by Joshua Schmidt and Farfa. The link for that is in the description below. Go check it out. And of course, to Matt, who honestly was a ultra chad for doing this, and he's got a new game coming out, so check it out in the description below if you want to show some support. And let's get down to business. And I'll start off with probably one of the most important points, which was about the casual audience and tournament attendance. So on the podcast, Matt said, and I quote, if you ever see casuals in your local tournament store, you can pat them on the back and say thank you for paying for my tournaments. They are a very important part of the ecosystem as well as competitive players. And when talking about tournament attendance, he said that one of the things that we can never underestimate is how much people love Yu-Gi-Oh! Now, there's two points to this. One is, of course, that people are vocal about playing other card games because of various reasons. There's no communication for ban lists. The price award is not as good as other games, even though I kind of disagree with that. And overall, people just have more card games to play. Konami now has actual competition in games like One Piece and Lorcana that are really up and coming, really pushed in the product space right now, and people really want to explore them. Yu-Gi-Oh! actually needs to fight for its audience to keep being active. The other TCGs are making a huge impact on the market, and Konami needs to kind of push back. And I think they've been trying to do that slowly, even though they're kind of a very cautious and traditional company, but still, now Yu-Gi-Oh! is actual real competition and it's actually taking away players. And the reality is, and this is something that I've been suspecting for a while, is that the casual player base actually pays for the experience of the smaller competitive player base. Meaning that if you're looking for reasons why cards like Skill Drain, Dimensional Barrier, and Dimension Shifter are still legal, and that a lot of decks are pushed through, you know, cards like Sang and Summoning that protect the player from doing mistakes or other built-in floodgates into new engines that are released. If you're wondering at all why that exists and why that is pushed in the product space so much, is because it's easier for casual players to pick up and win. And casual players, based on what Matt is saying, are actually paying for the broader experience. The more casual players you bring in and the less they have to pay, they actually make more money to the game than competitive players who just buy the cores online. Which makes sense, right? More players in the space are competitive. Think about your locals. Not everyone is super hyper competitive. The ones that Matt called invisibles just go into a store, buy a product, never participate in a tournament. These people are actually playing for the whole experience, which means that Konami wants to cater to them more than the competitive audience. So they're going to keep cards like Seal Drain, D Barrier, Dimension Shifter, legal to help them with their pet decks that need to be carried by those cards. Now that's no shade about people playing these cards and you will see these cards being played in hyper competitive decks by pros, but still it's much easier to play. And this is why I've been suspecting that these cards are remaining legal just to help that player base. And yes, people do love Yu-Gi-Oh! Based on what Matt is saying, we can't underestimate how much people love Yu-Gi-Oh! That's very true. People do love Yu-Gi-Oh! And I've been seeing a lot of people saying, uh, for example, Farfa in one of the comments to my tweets, that even though prizes are kind of bad and tournaments are like not that good and card design is bad, people love Yu-Gi-Oh! above everything else. Even love has its limits. And now that Konami actually has some competitive card games in the space besides itself, people are going to need to love this game a lot more in order to stay playing it. Now, talking about forbidden and limited lists a little bit, because, of course, I think this is the most protected subject out of everything. Quote, if the bottom line starts getting affected, you'd be surprised how flexible companies can be. If people just stopped buying stuff, you'll notice that things can change pretty quickly. End quote. And another quote, the sad thing is, there's business reasons that you can do it, but it ends up hurting your players and it's not morally right to do it. 
And he's talking here about designing cards that you know will ultimately be hit. Quote, printing overly pushed stuff that you know you'll have to address later. End quote. Now, Matt is not calling for a boycott. I'm not calling for a boycott. I think Matt was very brave and honestly a super cool guy for doing this video and speaking out as much as he could. So, you know, all the love to Matt because he has given his heart and soul to this game for years. But what he's saying essentially is that people could be a little bit braver if they actually want to make a change. We already knew that to some extent. There's obviously some business reasons behind the Forbidden and Limited list. You know, some new cards that need to sell future product or current product will not be hit on the ban list and people know that. And some other cards will be hit instead, not necessarily because it's the most correct decision or the most correct hit, but because it balances the business decisions and can make money for the game while also keeping players relatively happy. So, for example, the Sinful Spoil stuff, people are calling for the original Sinful Spoils to get banned on the next ban list, but Rage of the Abyss has a whole archetype that uses those cards called Azamina. So, a little tip based on what Matt is saying here is that in order to sell those cards, you need to keep the Wanted, the Abelstar, and Sinful Spoil stuff legal, so maybe the hits will be more on the Snake Eye side that are, have basically no relevance for the Azamina cards. But also, it's kind of good to see that Konami has the foresight to try to avoid cards that will just be banned immediately, even though in recent years we've seen some cards like Arise Heart, for example, that, you know, on the design table already seem very questionable and also get hit really, really quickly. Another quote about player sentiment, quote, you can go back and look at Japanese Twitter to look at how unpopular that change was, end quote, when talking about Master Rule 4. Quote, the competitive game doesn't always reflect the whole market sentiment, end quote. Another quote, then you start going, oh, sales are going down quote you can get access to this kind of data and sort of have an estimate on what's actually happening to the game speaking about sales so how much does konami actually care about what people say or what they do these quotes show that konami obviously has some sort of interaction with the player base even though it doesn't seem like it externally because konami doesn't really like to communicate with players, they do end up looking at data on the bottom line on what actually matters, which is money. Like Matt said in the podcast, and I'm paraphrasing, you know, people need to pay those card designers and those people working there. And those people are Yu-Gi-Oh players. You need to make them happy so they will pay you to do your job. While competitive players are significantly louder, probably, content creators and such, the invisibles, as I previously mentioned, the people who just walk in, buy a product, never participate in the tournament, so they don't really appear on any data, those are also people you need to be considering, and it's kind of hard to know what they're doing. But I think the bottom line from what you can take from here is that it's worth voicing your frustration and opinion, especially if you have a platform. Konami does read. There are sometimes feedback surveys, maybe on events that you've participated in, or maybe on Twitter or just social media in general. I'm sure that Konami representatives are there. And while other content creators might not be really good at, you know, actually taking action while voicing their opinion is fine, but like still going to events after that doesn't really show Konami anything is changing in terms of numbers. If you you know, voice your opinion, but also keep buying product the same amount. And I think that Konami looking at data is a direct proof of why, for example, Rarity Collection 2 happened really, really quickly, because the bottom line is that product was super successful with both competitive and non-competitive people, because it brought in a lot of really, really cool stuff into the game. So capitalize on that immediately, make more money. Rarity Collection 2 also was a relative success. And you can see that you know, when people buy stuff, Konami will keep doing the same thing. If people stop doing something, for example, Speed Duel is being discontinued, Konami will just stop doing it. So again, not calling for a boycott, Matt is not calling for a boycott, but if people hypothetically stop showing up for events, what do you think will happen? A little bit about products, quote, ultimately, as much as players don't like to hear it, the game is a business, and there are a lot of people whose jobs depend on whether or not people enjoy products that come out. And also about rarities, quote, it makes it very easy just like, hey, yeah, we print this, we can make it a secret rare, it will really push whatever product you put it in because it's so format warping. So I'll start actually from the, the end here, from the secret rare tweet. This is something that people figured out a while ago, even though it kind of changes 
over some sets maybe konami doesn't want to you know push things really hard but we saw that in infinite forbidden that every single secret rare was actually a really good card and you know ahead of the competitive season uwck and awcq those secret rares fiendsmith stuff mulchami perulia those pushed info like crazy and previous point about the fact that people don't like to hear it but the game is a business before everything else that is a thing where konami is balancing the game based on business decisions and i think it's fine you know for example in my job as you know an app designer i need to be balancing user experience with company metrics i can't go all in in one direction because you know my job is to balance those things I need to keep a good user experience, but also keep making the company successful. And this is exactly what Konami designers have to do as well. Like, let's not have some sort of illusion that this is not a business or their job. They need to be balancing cards that will be good enough so that people will care about products and buy the product, but also not push the envelope too much. Otherwise, people will stop playing. So yeah, I don't want to run this video too long. I do recommend everyone to go check out that video. I think my last thoughts is, first of all, that, you know, Matt, again, as I previously stated, is really, really cool for doing this video. I think two and a half hours with someone who worked at Konami for a long time and was super influential, again, under a lot of contracts, preventing him from saying a lot of things. But again, if you read between the lines, and take the quotes as they are and try to like extrapolate some data from it. This is what we've do been doing this video and I think it's really, really interesting. So if you care about the game and you're interested about how the inner workings of the game kind of look like, and I think a lot of us are because there's just zero actual communication, so we don't really know what's happening, I really recommend watching that video. Leave your comments below on the thoughts on the things that Matt said. Again, please, Keep things civil in the comments. Go check out Josh and Farfa's um, podcast because it was really great. And again, check out Matt's game in the description below as well. Thank you so much for watching. And we'll see you in the next one. Peace.